Good afternoon. Thank you for being with us today. I'm happy to see all of you here online and on site. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Gabriele Manoli, Gabriele is Team Track Assistant Professor at the Laboratory of Urban and Environmental Systems at EPFL. Today, he is going to give us a talk titled On Trees and Cities. To give you an idea of what to expect, the seminar will last for approximately one hour. Is Gabriele presenting for 40 to 45 minutes, and we can have time for QA. Um, it was agreed that questions are better asked at, at the end. If any urgent questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We'll try to take them up uh, for the discussion afterwards. Before that, the presentation, I would like to thank Gabriele for his availability and uh, the CIS team once again for organizing this event. And now, Gabriele, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Thanks for the nice introduction. <laughs> All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here today. And as Ian said, my talk is really about trees and, and cities. So let me, oh, sorry. Let me start uh, with, with a disclaimer, actually, because, you know, strictly speaking, uh, uh, my research is not exactly on, uh, on intelligent systems, so at least in the traditional sense. Uh, so, you know, when I was invited for, for this talk, uh, I actually, you know, decided to search for the definition of what intelligent systems are. And, you know, for example, I found, uh, found this one, which is that uh, intelligent systems are technologically advanced machines that perceive and respond to the world around them. So, uh, of course, uh, you know, during this talk, I will try to give you an overview of, of my research, uh, which is, as I mentioned, uh, mostly on trees. Uh, cities and, and, uh, and biological systems. So, but I will try to you know, address also this topic of intelligence from a different perspective in a sense. And I will try to you know, speculate a bit and argue or try to claim that also this type of you know, uh, organisms or, uh, or uh, you know, either biological or urban systems that we are seeing in this animation can be regarded as intelligent systems or natural intelligent systems in a sense. But uh, let's start from, from my research. So at the laboratory of uh, Urban and Environmental Systems, or URBES, we seek to describe and predict land atmosphere interactions and uh, couple the human natural dynamics. So the challenge, as you can see in this picture, is really to uh, you know, describe uh, a number of a variety of biotic and abiotic processes that occur over a wide range of spatiotemporal scales. So from the plant scale uh, to, the, to the global scale, and considering both natural and urban ecosystems. So let's start by focusing on, on the plant scale to you know, understand uh, why plants are so important within the earth system. So the functioning of vegetation is basically essential to describe the exchanges of water, mass, and energy at the land surface. And this is actually controlled by uh, uh, small pores on, on leaves called stomata, which we can see in this uh, illustration here, which basically uptake carbon and release water into the atmosphere. Now, this process basically drives root water uptake in the soil, the transport of water through the, through the plant tissues, and then the evapotranspiration fluxes into the atmosphere, which then regulate temperature and humidity in the boundary layer, in the atmospheric boundary layer. So basically, processes that occur at a very small scale, we are talking about micrometers when we are looking at stomata, control surface and subsurface, or control, and substantially impact and regulate surface and subsurface water dynamics at the catchment scale, with also implications for boundary layer processes and regional and global scale uh, circulation dynamics, for example. So because of the multiple scales involved here, uh, you know, modeling efforts, you know, the interest of my lab is mostly in uh, uh, providing mathematical description of these complex dynamics, we typically focus either on the plant scale or the ecosystem scale, because it's difficult to bridge the two. Uh, so let's start, uh, you know, at the plant scale. At the plant scale, what drives, you know, this flow of water, which is the, you know, one of the key uh, uh, interesting topics from, you know, from the hydrological perspective. But what drives this flow of water is really uh, the potential grad gradients of, of water potentials across this continuum from the soil to the plant to the atmosphere. And this is, you know, these fluxes are basically controlled also by the hydraulic properties of the different compartments. So, either the roots, uh, as you can see here. So, you know, the complex root system uptake water. This is transported through the xylem, which is basically, you know, what you have inside the trunk. And that's also sort of can be regarded as a porous medium, but, you know, is a, is a complex network of vessels. And then, of course, in the leaves, so you have the evapotranspiration and photosynthetic processes. So historically, these uh, dynamics have been described by the seminal work of Penman and Monteith in the 50s and 60s. Uh, but then over the past 40, 50 years, you know, research has basically focused upon improving the, the representation of, 
of you know, plant physiological mechanisms, plant hydraulics, and so on. So we moved from simple bucket representations. You now, like we typically call that like big leaf approximation. You assume that the plant is just one big leaf uh, characterized by resistance, which is driving this, this slope between the, the soil and the atmosphere. But then we moved from there to more refined description, like multidimensional descriptions of plant hydrodynamics, uh, accounting for you know, photosynthesis, biogeochemical processes, and so on and so forth. So let just uh, let me give you an example. This is a, a, an example of a state-of-the-art model that we developed a few years ago, precisely to describe and predict the hydraulic function of, of a plant, and also to study how plants interact and compete for water and light uh, you know, in, in, a, in an environment. Uh, so basically, in this case, you know, we consider the soil as a three-dimensional uh, porous medium, and also we had a one-dimensional description for, for the above-ground compartment. So more specifically, uh, in the soil, we basically saw the 3D Richards equation, which is a standard model for, uh, for unsaturated uh, water flow. And we, uh, we include, of course, a sink pair, which represents this root water uptake, so the uptake of water from the soil uh, through the plant and by the plant. So basically, we are describing the system in terms of water potential. Right? So you have water potential in the soil, psi. Then you have this water potential inside the plant, which is psi p, which is on, along this one-dimensional uh, model in this case. But then you also have the water potential in the leaf, psi l, which is what controls the exchanges with the atmosphere. So for the soil, we have you know, this 3D representation. Then we can do something similar for the above-ground compartment. Basically, we can assume that also the the plant tissues are a, a porous medium, and so the Darcy law also there to simulate water flow. And in this case, we have you know a different canopy layer, so different height z. We have this transpiration flux, so you know you have the canopy which is releasing water, and this is again controlled by water potential gradients between uh, psi p in the plant and psi l in, in the leaves. So as you can see, basically you have two equations here, but three unknowns, so the three potentials in the three different compartments. So we basically need a closure equation. And this can be accomplished by uh, you know, considering continuity of mass from the branches to the leaves. And using also uh, to describe how stomata, you remember that at the beginning I mentioned this, you know, pores that open and close, we use an optimality model. So I will not go into the details, but basically we are assuming that uh, a leaf tends to optimize uh, the carbon uptake. So they want to maximize the carbon which is uptaken from, uptaken from the atmosphere and minimizes the water losses into, into the atmosphere because you know, evapotranspiration is basically a loss for the plant. And of course, this optimization depends also on the condition in the atmosphere and the condition in the soil. So basically that's you know, uh, just you know, to give you an overview, but that's a fully coupled description of this complex system. And we use it to, for example, try to describe or estimate what is the vertical distribution of fluxes and, and water potentials. So uh, on the top here, you see, so this is, you know, assuming the, the canopy, so how, much, how many leaves, it's called the leaf area index, so how many leaves you have at the different uh, height of the plant. And you can see this is a transpiration flux. So in this experiment, we assume to have a tree, which is subject to water stress a long time. So there is no water added to the soil. And over time, we're looking at the fluxes. So transpiration, you can see clearly the night, da, night, sorry, night uh, the day transition, where during the day you have transpiration, then during the night you do not have it because you don't have uh, uh, the incoming radiation. There are some losses, but uh, that, that, that's a, a detail. Uh, and then we also simulate the water content in, in the plant. And then we are also looking at the water potentials in the soil and fluxes. So this is the root distribution uh, in the, you know, with different depths uh, in, in the soil. And you can see uh, that during daytime, you have root water uptake. So the plant is uptaking water, which is given, uh, illustrated by the red, uh, red uh, color here. So the, the, the positive flux exiting the soil. But actually, you also have something called hydraulic redistribution. So basically at night, because you have very negative potential, which have been created by the plant during the day, so part of the water is either released by root to the soil, or they are recirculated from uh, dry uh, to, sorry, from wet to dry part of the soil, always through the, uh, the rooting system. Uh, and, and basically this is an important process because it, it, it can sustain transpiration the day after if you are in very dry or, or stress conditions. Now, because of the uh, formulation of the model with this 3D description of the soil, we can also plan, play with different configurations of, of trees to see how they interact with each other and how they compete for, for water, which at the end is the resource, right? There. 
they are looking for and, and competing for. But also, you know, with some approximation, we cannot play with the competition for light because the more the leaves and the closer the trees, the less the light that can uh, filter, you know, down to the, for example, in this case, understory tree. So a tree that is smaller and it's below uh, the canopy of the of the overstory. And you know, with this type of simulation, we actually found out that competition for light and water can actually increase the stand level resilience to, to water stress through shading and localized hydraulic redistribution, meaning that if you're shading, the trees that are in the understory have you know, less uh, radiation to transpire, so they transpire a little bit less, otherwise they would reach stress quickly. Mm -hmm. And also the hydraulic redistribution can actually provide a little bit of extra water to these trees that have low uh, or shallow roots. So, so basically, the system is actually helping. So competition is, is, is in a way also favoring some, uh, uh, some, some process. Okay, so this was at the plant scale, but of course, you know, if you want to simulate what happens in the forest, you cannot really simulate every single tree. Uh, it becomes computationally too expensive, right? So at the ecosystem scale, we typically use what are called ecosystem models. And this is an example, the TNC model developed by uh, a colleague, uh, Simone Fatiki now at NUS. Basically, you know, this type of models make some simplification. So we go back to this uh, big leaf approximation. You don't have all the uh, refined hydraulic uh, uh, description, but we account for additional processes that are more important, but not more, but that are quite important at the ecosystem level. So for example, TNC simulates, of course, photosynthesis and uh, uh, water root water uptake, but it also solves for the surface energy balance. And it also considers, you know, how carbon is then allocated to the different plant compartments, so to uh, how it is allocated to, to, to the uh, leaves, to the branches, and so on and so forth. And in this case, like this model also has a new soil biogeochemistry model. So, you know, you can include additional processes to understand how ecosystems function on a uh, more detailed way, you know, not focusing only on water as seen before. Just to give you, you know, a flavor of why we develop these small type of models and how we can use them, uh, this is an application where we are interested in the implications or impact of uh, uh, forest conversion, tropical forest conversion to oil palm plantations, which is a big deal because especially, you know, over the past uh, a few decades, especially in the tropics, so Indonesia and Malaysia, uh, oil palm plantation has, you know, expanded significantly uh, at the expenses of tropical forests. Uh, so again, this is an example of simulation. So we wanted to quantify what are the changes in terms of evapotranspiration, so this flow of water from the, the soil, from, from the surface to the atmosphere, when you basically cut the forest and then at time zero in this case, you know, in this uh, graph here, at time zero you uh, plant an oil palm plantation, and, which is growing in time. Typically, you know, they grow for 20, 30 years. So in this figure, you see that at the beginning, when the plantation is young, uh, the plantation is basically transpiring less water than, than the forest. Uh, and this causes an increase in surface temperature because you have a change in the partition between sensible and latent feet, and basically less transpiration means higher temperature at the surface. But then, as soon as the plantation grows, uh, so we are looking at the, the box there, uh, the, plant, the oil palm plantation can actually transpire more water than the forest has replaced. And this is related to the high fruit productivity of oil palm. In fact, you know, that's why uh, it's so uh, successful oil palm because it produces a lot, a lot of fruits. And that's because the uh, productivity is very high. It, it means that it's consuming a lot of water. And this is illustrated by GPP, which is the gross primary productivity. It's just a measure of you know, how much uh, carbon is, uh, is used to, to produce uh, uh, so it's based on the, the productivity of, of the plantation. So basically, these simulations reveal that uh, the high yield of mature oil palm basically comes at the expense of water uh, consumption, which is a sort of trade of water for carbon, right? So you trade the water released into the atmosphere with the carbon that is stored in, in the fruit of the oil palm. And, but this can have implication for local water resources uh, because you might create uh, water scarcity issues uh, depending on, on where the plantations are, are established. So, uh, you know, with these few examples, right, of applications, what I wanted to convey is that vegetation really plays a key role in uh, regulating the exchanges between the surface and subsurface and the atmosphere. It's a short, sort of end shape, right, between, uh, between the two compartments. And so a proper representation of the functioning of vegetation is essential both for atmospheric, but also for uh, hydrologic and subsurface uh, hydrology applications. And this is true. 
uh, in natural systems, but it's true also in urban systems, where you know vegetation is actually key to reproduce how uh, the, the climate and these exchanges of water, carbon, and energy occur also in urban environments. So a proper representation of vegetation is essential also in uh, urban climate models from the scale of, of buildings and, and neighborhoods up to the city or regional scale. And this basically brings me to, to the next part of my talk, which is you know, how we, 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 we study and the importance of, of modeling and considering vegetation in, in the built environment. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, the green cities, urban jungles, urban forests are all concepts that nowadays are uh, more and more uh, advertised, right, every day. And there is this uh, trend and um, interest in greening our cities. But, you know, most of these efforts are really guided by aesthetic and qualitative principles. There is no uh, quantitative understanding of the underlying uh, processes, case, and, and feedbacks, which are key if you want to, you know, to make a proper design or if you want to improve uh, the climatic condition of the city or improve the well-being of people which are exposed to, to, to the urban climate uh, urban climatic conditions so uh, vegetation provides a number of ecosystem services uh, one of these is the, the, the cooling effect so vegetation as we have seen before can can cool uh, surface and air temperature and so can remediate in a sense to the so-called urban italian effect now, this is the uh, observed increasing temperature that we have uh, in cities compared to the rural surrounding, as illustrated in this map for, for London, right? Where you clearly see that the average temperature in the urban area is way higher. So it's way hotter than the temperature in the surrounding rural land. And you can uh, you know, mathematically describe this difference by you know, the, delta, so the difference delta T between these two averages. Uh, by, to these two um, average temperatures. Uh, however, uh, basically what, what we don't know really is that uh, how much vegetation, so what, what is exactly the benefit of vegetation? So how much vegetation does a city need to reduce uh, an effect like the urban Italian effect? And is the same amount of vegetation needed uh, uh, in different cities, in different climatic conditions? For example, if you are in Singapore, London, or, uh, or Zurich, is the same amount of vegetation needed? Uh, and that's the type of questions that you know we wanted to answer. And to answer these questions, so we started by analyzing uh, urban Italian, in this case surface urban Italian, at the global scale, so for multiple cities around the world. And we developed a coarse grain model to try to quantify uh, the, 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 the processes behind this increasing temperature. Uh, so I will not go into the details, of course, but just to give you again a flavor of what we did, we basically started from the surface energy balance illustrated here, and we consider a city as a perturbation to the original uh, rural estate. Then we employed the urban scaling laws to link the properties of a city, so the, the characteristics, uh, the urban characteristics like the building height, as illustrated on the graph on the left here, to population size. So there are, you know, there is evidence that many properties of a city scale basically with the size, with the population of a city. And we did the same for background climatic conditions. So we tried to relate uh, uh, basic uh, uh, climatic variables like radiation, in this, uh, illustrated in this figure here, uh, to precipitation. Uh, basically, if you now combine right, uh, the surface energy balance with these urban scaling laws and background climatic conditions, and you do some math, you can basically write the intensity of urban Italian, so this delta Ts, this temperature difference, as a function of two variables only, namely precipitation P and population N. Well, basically, population is really an aggregate uh, for urban infrastructure size, and precipitation is nothing but uh, you know, a proxy for the global variability of, uh, of vegetation and climatic characteristics. So let me point out here that you know, we, define, we, we call this model a coarse grain model because we are, we are really not looking at fine grain properties. Those are average in, in time and space. So, uh, in a sense, what we are doing is similar to statistical physics where temperature uh, is nothing but a coarse grain uh, metric for the energy carried out by all the molecules in the system. So similarly here, we are not looking at the details, you know, at the building scale of a specific city, specific neighborhood. We are really looking for, you know, explaining general trends on a global scale, some emergent patterns that, you know, arise at larger scales. So, because if you go you know, into the details of the smaller scales, then things are different and, and more complicated, of course. 
So let's have a look at the results now. Uh, basically, what we found, both observations and, uh, and, uh, and simulation revealed, is that uh, if you look at the panel A, is that basically the, uh, this delta T, so the intensity of urban island, varies non-linearly with background climate. So in this case, you see that it increases in the first panel. Delta Ts increases at the beginning linearly with mean annual precipitation. But then for high precipitation values, so in wet region, it saturates. Uh, and the same, so this nonlinearity translates into a similar relation. So I'm looking at panel B now uh, between uh, the urban Italian intensity and the ground temperature. So meaning that you know, the, the warmer the climate, the lower the urban Italian intensity is. And we also explain uh, in panel C, the observed scaling of that, that yeah, so urban Italian intensity with the size of a city. But we show that this scaling is not universal as you know, previously thought. But it really also depends on background climatic conditions, as illustrated by you know, the solid and dashed line. So depending on the background climate, the, the slope of, of the scaling law is different. Now, uh, the, the, the beauty of having a simple model explaining this, this, uh, these trends is that we can try to uh, explain you know, what are the underlying processes that cause this urban warming effect. And what we found out is basically that uh, changes in evapotranspiration between urban and rural areas. So again, uh, what, you know, uh, what vegetation transpires or the soil transpires from the soil to the atmosphere. And these differences between urban and rural areas is what drives and, and causes the shape of this uh, uh, relation between the intensity of urban island and mean annual precipitation. Basically, and I'm looking now at the green line, you know, the, those are the changes in evapotranspiration as a function of mean annual precipitation. So what does this mean? Basically, if you are in an arid region, right, uh, and uh, uh, the city is typically vegetation in the city, even if little vegetation, but still is irrigated. So the evaporation fluxes are higher in the city compared to the surrounding if you are, say, in a desert, for example. So this means that the evapotranspiration is higher in the city and can cause a so-called oasis effect. So the city can actually be cooler than, than the surrounding if that's a very dry uh, climate. Uh, on the other hand, if you are you know, in a wet climate and so your city is surrounded probably by dense vegetation, then this dense vegetation transpire way, transpire way more water into the atmosphere than uh, the urban area. And this, change in evapotranspiration is what causes the change in, in temperature, or it's the major cause of this change in temperature, because of course there are other effects related to roughness, uh, related to, to albedo, and so on. Uh, now, the implication of this nonlinearity is also that the efficiency of vegetation as a cooling uh, strategy or as heat mitigation strategy in a city depends on background climate. So basically there is no silver bullet, right? depending on where you are in the city, vegetation can have an impact or, or a different one. And this is illustrated by this video here, where I'm showing the intensity again of urban Thailand, so Delta TS, uh, as a function of the green color, so the urban green color on the y-axis. Uh, so how much vegetation you have in the city, okay, from zero to 80% in, in this case, as a function again of mean annual precipitation, which is a proxy more or less of where you are in the world. And you can see that if you're in a dry region, right, then a small amount of vegetation is actually enough to substantially reduce this, this urban induced warming. But if you are, say, in the tropics, so where you know, precipitation is high, like around 2,000, 3,000 millimeters per year, then 50% of vegetation in the city is still not enough to significantly reduce uh, the warming effect induced by the built uh, surfaces, because you, have, you are surrounded by significant uh, you know, vegetation, which is significantly cooling down the, the rural surfaces. Now, of course, uh, uh, you know, this approach is relatively, so it, it's this coarse grain approach that we developed uh, is extremely useful to understand global climate relations, so patterns at the global scale. But if we want to inform a design or planning at the you know, smaller scales, then we definitely need to, you know, to approach the problem from, from a different perspective. And, and that's why uh, with, with colleagues at ETH and US and Princeton, we developed uh, a new, uh, urban ecohydrological model. So basically, we combined uh, you know, the components of the ecohydrological model that I showed you before, TNC, which resolves plant physiology, uh, water, and energy fluxes, uh, with an urban canyon scheme. So basically, we, we combine you know, our understanding of vegetation with the uh, typical tools that are used in urban climate simulation to simulate uh, uh, a city block. 
Uh, now, so this, this model you see, basically is solving the energy and water budget at the hourly time scales. Uh, and what is uh, great is that we have a detailed description of vegetation, right? Because we, uh, we, we have a <coughs> mathematical description of the physiological function of vegetation, which means that we can you know, describe uh, different type of green spaces from you know, green roots to street trees uh, or ground vegetation. We can also simulate you know, what happens if you have different species. And we also are able to simulate the two-way interaction between vegetation and urban climate, because on one end, vegetation can change the microclimate of, of urban canyon, but also the, you know, the built environment is modifying the climate and that has an impact on vegetation function itself. So in this sense here, we have a fully coupled description of you know, how vegetation interacts with the built uh, environment from a water and climate perspective. So just to give you, uh, you know, few, uh, just to show you, we, we tested the model against, you know, uh, data from different cities. This is just an example from uh, uh, a low-rise area in Singapore. Uh, so here you see you know, the comparison of observed and simulated net radiation on the left, uh, sensible heat, latent heat, and the model basically performs well. It, it, the performances are comparable or improved to existing uh, uh, urban canyon models. And so we use the, the model to try to, to make some predictions and understand, okay, so what are the effects of trees uh, in terms of you know, changing microclimate in cities with different background conditions, for example. Uh, let's take Phoenix and, and Zurich as two examples of cities with, you know, uh, which are very different and which are very different climatic conditions. So here we are looking at basically at the simulated changes in two meter air temperature um, over time, so, you know, from, uh, from uh, during the, uh, daily cycle, so the diurnal evolution changing to in two meter air temperature for different levels of tree cover, which is illustrated by the different colors, so from 20% to 80%. So you know, basically how much uh, your, your trees are actually occupying space in, in the urban canyon. And you can see that if you're in Phoenix, uh, uh, having trees basically causes two peaks, two cooling peaks. One is early in the morning and one late in the afternoon. And, uh, with you know, high tree cover, you can actually decrease temperature by up to six degrees. While in Zurich, uh, you still have a cooling effect, but you have only one peak around uh, uh, mid-afternoon, but the, now the temperature decrease is substantially lower, so it's only uh, roughly one degree. And of course, uh, let me say that you know, we are assuming in this case that vegetation is irrigated, so you know, uh, it's fully functioning. There's no any water stress that might happen uh, in a place like Phoenix if, if you do not uh, further irrigate the soil. <laughs> but the, uh, having a model means that we can also now partition uh, uh, by switching on and off different processes, what are the mechanisms behind this uh, cooling effect? Uh, and so the, the, the cooling effect by trees uh, is basically controlled by, by three main processes. So you have some radiation effect. Uh, so the introduction of, of trees in a canyon uh, introduce changes in, in radiation and this actually acts uh, to warm uh, the, the, the canyon. Uh, but then you have uh, evapotranspiration fluxes, which of course, as you have seen, provide a cooling effect. <coughs> and in, in, in Phoenix, you basically have these two peaks, precisely because of, of the stomata story that we saw at the beginning, right? Because in Phoenix, uh, during midday, it's, when, you know, uh, it's the hottest time of the day, so you have a very high vapor pressure deficit. And because of the very dry and hot conditions, basically the plant switches off the, the so closes the stomata because it wants to, to avoid uh, too low uh, water potential and avoid the uh, risk, risky conditions. So uh, the stomata closed, transpiration is basically switched off or reduced. And that's why you have that, that peak is basically when, uh, so that uh, uh, you have two peaks because basically in, in between uh, transpiration was limited. That's, that is not happening in Zurich where there is no, uh, stomatal closure, and so you have you know, the full peak. Uh, so evapotranspiration, so the cooling effect of evapotranspiration typically fully counteract the warming effect of radiation, but you also have some roughness effect, which may also act as a warming uh, factor. And that is what explains uh, uh, what we see in Zurich, that I didn't mention it before, but you see that in Zurich early in the morning, you might also have some some warming effects. So trees typically provide a cooling effect, but in some condition, they can also increase temperature uh, a little bit. So let me summarize in summary. So what are the, the mechanisms at play here? 
So basically, if you have introduced trees in an urban canyon, uh, you have a radiation effect because you know the canopy is trapping more radiation inside the canyon, and that acts as a, as a warming factor, right? Then you have some shading effect, which uh, you know lower the, the surface temperature, but they also uh, you know it means that the, the vegetation, if you have vegetation in, in the understory, so you have some, some grasses below the tree, they receive less radiation, and so they transpire less. So you basically reduce the cooling uh, factor associated with the transpiration of the lower vegetation. And then if you also have a tree which is not transpiring, uh, because you know in the simulation, we basically switch off, right? In transpiration, we only look at radiation effect in, in this case. Uh, the, the tree without transpiration is warming up during the day. And that means that it's releasing further sensibly. So if you have a non-transpiring tree, that is you know, uh, causing in terms of radiation effect, a, a warming, an overall warming effect. But then you have this evapotranspiration because in reality, these are evapotranspiring. And this means that the radiation which is incoming is, uh, is partition between sensible and latent heat. You have more latent heat if, uh, if you have uh, the trees and this is causing a decrease in uh, surface and, te and air temperature. But then, as I mentioned, you also have some roughness effect, meaning that if you have a tree within the canyon, you increase uh, uh, the roughness. So uh, basically the aerodynamic resistance is higher. So you have less turbulent exchanges of, of heat from the surface to the atmosphere. And so you reduce cooling and you know, this contributes to, to a warming effect. So overall, uh, you know, trees provide the cooling uh, effect, but you know, that's actually the sum of all these uh, uh, processes combined. And so just to show you some final simulation. So this is just, you know, we were looking just at the daily uh, diurnal cycle, but now let's look also, you know, on seasonal time scale, how this changes. So here I'm looking at, again, two meter temperature changes in Phoenix and Zurich for two different uh, uh, cases of, of uh, green cover, 20 and 80%. And, you know, as a function of daytime on the X axis and different seasons on the Y axis. So overall trees provide a, a cooling effect, especially in summer, but as we, we have seen, you know, in some cases, like for example, in the case of Zurich, you might have also some warming effect induced by trees under some specific condition and typically, you know, around October or, or November. But of course, trees provide a cooling effect when, it, when it's most needed. So during summertime, when temperatures are highest, uh, vegetation is definitely beneficial because it can significantly reduce temperature. So uh, I, you know, uh, now I would like to go back to the original, right, uh, uh, original uh, uh, idea of intelligence that you mentioned, because you know my work is mostly focused on vegetation. But at the beginning, you know, we we, you know, we were discussing an intelligent systems that technologically advanced machines that perceive and respond to the uh, to the world around them. Now, if you remove the world technologically, I think that the definition applies quite well also to uh, to plants. So in a sense, you know, they can be considered naturally intelligent systems because they do perceive and respond to the world around them. So you have a complex root network which, you know, explore the soil and make intelligent decisions on, on you know, which direction to grow and search for water and nutrients. Then you have transport of, of water and, and carbon and nutrient through uh, complex networks, you know, like the xylem or the leaf venation. And you also have regulatory processes like the stomata opening and closure that we've seen before that uh, basically depending on the condition of the soil or the atmosphere, decide how to regulate the fluxes and to open and close in order to avoid risky conditions or, 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 or in order to uh, respond to, uh, to, to the world around them. And these actually have any implications on the fluxes you know, towards the atmosphere and so on. Uh, and the picture is actually more complicated than that. Because, uh, well, we all know that, you know, plants basically created the, the, the levels of oxygen that we have in the atmosphere uh, today. But in the, in the below ground, uh, basically the, the root growth is also supporting, uh, you know, a complex carbon-based ecosystem. So basically roots are growing and they also release some uh, organic compounds which are used by symbiotic fungi to grow which in exchange actually provide uh, nutrients and mineral which are useful and are used by the plants. Uh, so, you know, basically all these complex dynamics uh, uh, defines what are the physical chemical processes, physical chemical characteristics of the soil. 
but you are also building a sort of fungal network, just connecting different species, different uh, plants. Uh, and uh, you know, in this way, they are basically exchanging signals and, and materials. So uh, that's why you know, if you look at this type of complexity, even if plants have never been really you know, regarded as intelligent. So when, when you think about intelligence, you don't really think about plants. But in reality, over the past you know, uh, few decades, plant science has started to, 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 to rethink about this. And, and, and you know, what we know now is that plants are not just you know, passive carbon fixing entities, but they, they are actually, you know, they, they exhibit goal oriented behaviors because they continuously assess and manipulate the environment around them. Just think about, you know, something I haven't presented here, but you know, how they interact with pollinators, for example, right? So uh, plants, uh, uh, you know, attract pollinators with food rewards, for example, right? Or they also, uh, you know, try to manipulate uh, insects by using colors, by using uh, shapes, uh, even some uh, uh, chemicals that, you know, change the, the brain uh, uh, function of, of insects. So they are really manipulating the environment, which in a sense is, is a signal or, or uh, is what we typically associate with, with intelligence, right? Uh, if that was not convincing enough, because you know, plants in the end are you know, relatively complex systems, but we can also find examples in even simpler uh, biological organisms that display a sort of intelligence. So this, I really like this example. This is a, a, an amoeba, it's called uh, Physarum polycephalum. And basically it's a, it's a brainless single cell which explores space in the search for, uh, for food, for, for resources. And it, it's able, even in a maze, to find the shortest path that you know, connects food sources. So this is a famous experiment. They basically placed this, this amoeba uh, in, in a maze. They placed two food sources indicated by AG, you see at the uh, two, two places of, uh, of, the, of the maze. And they let the, the system evolve. So they let the amoeba grow and, and search for food. What happens is that in the maze, you basically have four possible paths connecting the, the two uh, food sources. But over you know, the time of, uh, uh, that the amoeba is growing and, and, and exploring space, then it converges precisely on the shortest path. So this means that you know, even cellular material, in a sense, display evidence of a primitive intelligence because it's able to, to make a computation. In fact, what this amoeba is basically doing, what the slime mode is doing, is solving a, a, a so-called optimal transport uh, problem, uh, which in mathematics is also known as the monsch kantorovich problem. And for example, some uh, colleagues uh, in, uh, in Padova, the Department of Mathematics, uh, tried to, you know, they, they actually reformulated this monsch kantorovich problem in a continuous form, and they taking inspiration from, from the slime mode dynamics. So basically you can, look at this problem as a set of partial differential equations, where you have one equation for the conservation of mass, for the density, basically, of the, the slime mold, and, and one ODE, one order of differential equation, for, uh, for the characteristics of, of, the, the, of the flow dynamics. But basically, so you have a set of equations, and it can be proven that the, uh, this set of equations have a time uh, asymptotic equilibrium, which is exactly the, the solution of the monsch kantorovich problem, and that's the, the last figure here, which is exactly the path that the slime mode chooses. So the slime mode is basically solved in such a complex, <laughs> uh, uh, complex uh, you know, uh, mathematical problem without any, uh, uh, any you know, apparent intelligence, right? Because it's brainless. What is even more interesting is that, you know, if you, further play with, with this uh, interesting uh, biological organism. And for example, you, you try to play to, to put different food sources you know, in space, uh, but in a way that you resemble the different cities around the city of Tokyo. Well, what the, uh, uh, the slime mold does is that it starts exploring space, searching for all these food sources. It connects to all these food sources, but then you see over time, you reach a final network, a tubular uh, network of, uh, of the, you know, the, the shape basically of these uh, uh, organisms. And that network uh, is remarkably similar to the actual railway system that you have in the Tokyo area, which is connecting the different cities around Tokyo. Uh, so basically this line mold again has no brain, has uh, you know, no awareness, at least for what we know, 
uh, but still is, you know, is able to produce a structure with similar properties to the real network, to the real railway network, which has been designed by uh, transport engineers, right? So in a sense, so this is a, a sort of biological prototype of computers and robotic devices, uh, which are capable of you know, solving problems of, of graph optimization and computational uh, geometry. Uh, now, of course, you know, people played uh, quite a bit with, with this uh, you know, idea. And for example, they show that you know, not only the railway network in London can be reproduced by, by the slime mold, but even the road network in the US, uh, but what I, I find interesting is that uh, if we don't focus only on the network, right, but uh, uh, we look at uh, the coevolution of, of the network with the uh, uh, with population. So you know, I think there is an interesting analogy here, basically between biological systems and urbanization. But urbanization is not just a, a network, right? You also have population and the built environment, which uh, explores space and grows in time. So if you actually consider this coevolution between a transport network and, and the mass, right, the mass of people or the mass of, of buildings, we find another interesting analogy with biology. And in this case, we can look at uh, cancer metastasis because also in that case, the uh, evolution, the growth of, of cancer cells is always associated with the formation of new blood vessels, which is exactly like the growth of cities is always associated with the formation of new railways or new roads. And so building on this you know, ideas and I find extremely you know, exciting analogies with biological system, we are now trying to, to, to study and, and, and describe the evolution of cities over long time scales, which is a grand challenge in, in the study of cities in a sense. So this is a work in progress, but uh, what I'm showing in this animation is basically the evolution of London over the past 200 years. And you see the formation of the railway network and the coevolution with population density, which is the, the, the color scale in, in red. Uh, so uh, to, you know, trying to learn again from biological systems, we can try to describe this dynamics by considering population density as a continuous uh, variable in space and time, uh, which diffuse and grow, right? And grow logistically, for example. So if you assume uh, an equation like this, like a diffusion type with logistic growth, it's actually, uh, it's actually uh, the, the so-called fischer kolgomorov equation, which is a standard model for uh, population growth in, in, uh, in uh, uh, in biology and, and ecology. Then, of course, we can play a bit. So, you know, we, because we are looking at cities, so we can modulate the growth rate, so the logistic growth, uh, by considering some spatial attractiveness. But in a city, it depends on some economic constraints. So, you know, you want to be close to the workplace or close to the train station. So, there are some uh, economic constraints which you know, are quite well studied in urban economics. But then we can also couple this, you know simple growth equation in time and space with, with the evolution of an adaptive network. And again, I won't go into the details, but we are simply trying to, you know, as we have seen for the slime mold, to simply have a network that evolves in time and space according to the evolution of the population density. So you add the network, uh, sorry, network nodes, and then you connect the links based on, again, the, the, the spatial pattern of population density, basically. Now, the interesting thing is that, you know, despite the simplicity of this approach, because we only have really, you know, two main governing equations, but we are able to reproduce the observed space-time evolution of London over 200 years, you know, and, you know, from the early beginning, as illustrated at the top, to, to present days. Of course, we are not interested in simulated, you know, fine grain uh, heterogeneities, but, you know, uh, as a general, you know, at the macroscopic level, you know, the properties of, of, the, of the city are, are maintained and are properly simulated. This means that uh, basically complex urban dynamics can be simulated, can be described in a sense by first order uh, principles, which take inspiration from biological systems. So uh, I want now to go back, you know, before concluding to, to, to where we started, right? So this concept of, of intelligence in a sense, because I find remarkable that, uh, you know, humans, which you know, uh, are considered by ourselves, you know, the most intelligent species on Earth. But if we look at, at cities, at you know, human settlements from, from space, on a macroscopic level, you know, we see remarkable similarities with the dynamics of simple biological uh, systems. And this, in a sense, raises you know, fundamental questions on the relationship right, between humans and, and nature, because we 
you know, our societies have become sort of disconnected from the natural environment, but in the end, uh, you know, we are part of it and we seem to follow also very you know, similar uh, rules. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, we can also learn from biological systems, maybe, you know, which developed and evolved over millions of years, how to design more you know, resilient or sustainable uh, infrastructure, for example. So uh, to, to, to conclude, in conclude, today I try to you know, give you an overview of, of my research and mostly about you know, the role of vegetation within the Earth system with a specific focus on, on cities and urban microclimate. So we have seen that you know, the impact of trees uh, uh, on, again, urban microclimate really vary diurnally and seasonally, and that's uh, regulated by a variety uh, of, of processes and mostly radiation, evapotranspiration, and rough density are what are controlling really the cooling effect of vegetation in the city. But we have also seen that uh, urban rural systems uh, exhibit emerging global scale behavior, right? We have seen the how we can you know, actually explain the pattern of urban Thailand on a global scale. And this type of dynamics can be described by simple, right, in a sense, coarse grain representation of the underlying uh, social and, and physical processes, making some assumptions, of course. But then speculating a bit uh, uh, you know, on this link between uh, biological systems and, uh, and uh, artificial intelligence systems, right, we have seen that also plants and other simple biological organisms perceive and respond uh, uh, to the world around them. And they therefore show evidence of a sort of primitive intelligence. And the same is true for complex urban systems because complex urban dynamics apparently can also be described by first order principles inspired from biological systems. So I think you know, these results tend to, to hint to the possibility maybe you know, finding some uh, uh, unifying theories that really explain complex uh, dynamics, even across uh, systems which are apparently very different. And uh, that's all. Thank you for your attention. And uh, thank you so much for your talk. Thanks for all of you online and on site. Um, regarding our next event, we have now a small break. We are back on the 9th of January with Professor Sarah Teichmann from the Welcome Sanger Institute in UK. And then on the 16th, so we have again an internal Get to Know Your Neighbor seminar with Alex Persat from Life Science. Thank you, and we hope to see you all soon again. Bye bye.